Um, so we will start uh, with the lectures from Carlos Hoyos. Today is the first lecture. So please, Carlos. OK, thank you. So, uh, well, during the lecture, if you want to stop me and ask questions, please do so. Uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, applications of holography to QCD. Uh, as you have seen during these days, we have the holographic duality. On one side, uh, we have a gauge theory. And on the other side, we have a gravity theory. Which, in the cases that we know the duality exists, there's uh, some string theory construction, actually. No? So between these two sides, uh, when we have the duality between these two sides, we can do it uh, in the case where the gauge theory is strongly coupled. And then that corresponds to the gravity theory being weakly coupled. Okay, so uh, the fact is that this is a strong weak duality allows us to uh, use this uh, gravitational theory, the weakly coupled regime, where we have control over this theory, to uh, compute things in this uh, gauge theory in the strongly coupled regime, where in principle uh, we have much less control, or we don't even do, uh, we don't even know how to do some uh, compute some observables or do calculations here. Now, in particle physics, no, in the standard model, there is a sector which is strongly coupled, which is uh, quantum chromodynamics. or QCD. Okay, so since the very beginning uh, where the holographic duality was proposed, people started thinking about how to use this holographic duality to uh, do uh, calculations uh, for quantum chromodynamics or find uh, the values of observables for this theory. Uh, by using the duality and doing the calculation in the gravitational theory. Okay, so let's say a few things about uh, QCD. Right, uh, there is so this is the theory that uh, tells us how uh, the strong interactions between uh, hadrons. No, this is the theory be behind the strong interactions between hadrons that we can observe in experiments and that bind the protons and neutrons in nuclei. So this will be like, let's say, how we observe first uh, the existence of this uh, uh, force, no? and then we understood later that uh, behind these uh, strong interactions and this uh, binding force between the protons and neutrons, we have some gauge theory, which is QCD, which is an SU3 jam mills. plus uh, a number of flavors. In the fundamental representation. So this is called the flavors. Now, 
QCD has a characteristic scale, which is of the order of 200 MeV, roughly speaking. Okay, and depending on uh, the processes uh, that we are observing, what is the energy of these processes, uh, we have two different regimes for this theory. So you have energies which are much larger than, the, than this characteristic scale. Then QCD is weakly coupled. And if we have energies much below this characteristic scale, or, well, roughly of the order of this characteristic scale or below, the theory is strongly coupled. Okay, so when the theory is weakly coupled, uh, we understand how to do calculations and uh, compute observables. In this case, we just have uh, the microscopic degrees of freedom of this theory. So we have the gauge uh, fields of the Jamil theory. So we have uh, some spin one massless particles. the gluons, that are the ones responsible for uh, the interaction. They carry the force associated to this gauge group. Um, we have uh, eight of them. Right? And then we also have uh, the quarks, which are spin one half, the fermions, that are in the fundamental representation. So the number of quarks, that uh, the number of flavors that is relevant depends on the energy scale that uh, we are considering. So for energies be to, be below lambda QCD, then typically only two or three flavors of quarks are relevant. Okay, so typically NF uh, is two or three. Yes. What fixes lambda QCD? What, what fixes lambda QCD? What fixes the characteristic scale for QCD? Well, so lambda QCD is a parameter of the theory. So th in principle, it could have any other value, but in nature we observe it has this value. Uh, so, it's so it's some parameter in the Lagrangian when we write down Young Mills Lagrangian? No. Uh, I will maybe mention this okay, okay. a bit later, but here in the Lagrangian, in principle, we have a dimensionless coupling, the jam mills constant, and then when we do radiative corrections, then uh, this uh, coupling starts running, okay, so it becomes dependent on the scale, and then uh, how this runs depends on this characteristic scale of QCD. So, Instead of having a dimensionless coupling constant, we end up with some dimensionful parameter that determines this running and the other properties of QCD. Okay, so this is called dimensional transmutation. I think I will mention this later as well. Okay, thanks for the I, question. I, I guess perhaps it's worth saying that, I mean, some people define lambda QCD as one GeV, but that's in the case of pure glue, right? I mean, the, the, the glue ball mass. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah, this, uh, well, in the perturbative case, this lambda QCD depends on several things like the number of flavors, the scheme, and so on. But okay. Uh, yeah. 
So here, when we have this description, and we have this uh, weirdly couple uh, uh, particles, then we have some analytic control. We can apply, for instance, perturbation theory. And we can also do some non-perturbative semi-classical calculations, like instanton calculations. Okay, and in this case we have some analytic analytic control of the theory. So we can systematically use a uh, weak coupling expansion to uh, compute observables in this theory, as long as we are at high energies. So at the strong coupling, so this means at low energies for QCD, uh, we don't observe uh, quarks and gluons. Like instead, we observe uh, mesons and baryons. Okay, so the mesons are bosons, and the variants are fermions. And these are objects that are, have a large mass compared to, for instance, the quarks that appear uh, here, typically. And uh, the masses of these objects are determined by the scale of the lambda QCD. Okay. So these are, have masses. Now, we don't have, uh, in this case, uh, weak coupling, uh, a weakly coupled theory that we can used to describe this uh, uh, as we do here using perturbation theory, but we have some techniques uh, that we can apply to the strongly coupled QCD theory to uh, compute observables. So we can have a, uh, the following first principles methods. So one of them is uh, lattice QCD. Okay, and this consists on uh, taking a space-time, making a discretization of space-time. And then compute the path integral numerically on this, this Discretize space time. I guess, in principle, this is not really an analytic tool, but it allows us to co do calculations uh, for QCD and compute things like the masses of these objects or the interactions between these objects from the QCD theory. Now, other methods are effective field theories. In particular, chiral perturbation theory. So what this is doing is uh, use symmetries to 
construct uh, an action. Uh, expanding in the ratio of the energy to the QCD scale, roughly speaking. Okay, so this means we have a low energy effective theory, and we uh, have some fields that are associated to this uh, mesons and variants. And then we start adding terms in the action that uh, are more important at low energies, and then we start correcting with terms that are less important at high energies. This is the usual effective field theory approach. Okay. So, using the symmetries, we can constrain the form of this action. There are some unknown coefficients, but we can fix these unknown coefficients by looking at experiments or doing calculations in lattice QCD, and then comparing to the results you get from this action. Okay, so these are the tools we have uh, in field theory to describe uh, QCD at weak coupling, at, at the strong coupling. Okay, and then beyond first principle methods, we can write phenomenological models. So these will be models that are not really QCD, but try to capture some properties of QCD, like uh, having weakly coupled quarks at high energies or having the quarks confined inside these mesons and variants at low energies. So we can also have phenomenological models. Okay, so the models can be fit to experiment, but then uh, when you apply it to uh, some other regime beyond the one you used to fit the model, then you are extrapolating. Okay, so you don't know if you're going to get uh, the right result or not, but uh, at least you know the model coincides with QCD in some, in some regime. Okay. Any questions up to here? Yes. Those inequalities in the second um, yeah. quote, um, I don't understand that. If the energy is large, why is it weakly, weakly, cop weakly, weakly coupled? Why is weakly coupled? If the yeah, I haven't explained this in detail. I will explain later. But essentially, this uh, coupling depends on the energy. And then it depends on the ratio of this energy and this uh, lambda QCD scale. Okay. So when this is large, this becomes uh, weakly coupled. The Maybe I can. More or less the Jamil's coupling constant. Roughly speaking, goes like one over the log of the energy over lambda QCD. Okay. So when the energy with a minus, I guess, no. when energy becomes very large, then uh, this uh, log becomes large, and then the jam mills coupling becomes small. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. There's one question in the chat. What is the global mass independent of lambda QCD? Well, <laughs> is the global mass independent of lambda QCD? My comment previously. <laughs> ah, no, I think it's proportional to lambda QCD. Yeah. There was some other question. Yes. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so uh, lambda G is a characteristic scale, but it's dependent on the system. It, well, I, I know when I am. <laughs> in a perturbative regime, if my energy uh, is approximate of that, but uh, if, if I set on value uh, to lambda of QCG, 
it depends on the system or no. In so, so in the full theory, like the real QCD thing, lambda QCD is a fixed scale. Okay, but when you do a calculation to find exactly what lambda QCD is, might depend on how you do okay. the calculation. Thanks. Okay. No more questions? Okay. So, so, I'm, so we will be interested in so describing, well, first the vacuum properties of QCD, like uh, the fact that uh, you have these uh, hadrons at the strong coupling instead of quarks and gluons. But we will also be interested in uh, describing QCD in, uh, at finite temperature and finite uh, chemical potential. Okay. So, we are interested in finding the properties of uh, QCD, the final temperature and chemical potential, in particular, barium chemical potential. OK, so why do we want to do this? Because uh, this is in, of interest for experiments of heavy ion collisions. Okay, so what happens in these experiments is that uh, you take uh, two nuclei, which are very heavy. This means they have a lot of nucleons, protons and neutrons, like gold or lead. And then you accelerate them at ultra-relativistic speeds, and then you make them collide. Okay, so before the collision, they have an aspect which is more or less like this. This will be... Uh, the heavy ions, so they are just the nuclei of some atoms. And because of the higher speeds, they suffer Lorentz contraction, so they have this kind of pancake shape. And then after they collide, what happens is that uh, if the speed is very large, most of the baryons continue their path in, through the other nuclei, but there is uh, some energy deposition in between. Okay, so there is a collision, and then uh, just start forming here some uh, kind of uh, ball of uh, matter. Okay, so people have studied what comes out of uh, this matter, and what they observe is that. Uh, is consistent with having some almost perfect fluid. So here, the result of the collision. Looks like some kind of uh, blob of uh, very dense uh, QCD matter. And then this starts expanding okay, in some way, and then after the density goes down enough, then it hadronizes and it becomes uh, mesons and variants that you see in the detector. Okay, So by looking at uh, how these uh, particles are distributed in the detector, people can infer some properties of the matter that was formed during the collision. And it looks like uh, this matter uh, at the very beginning of the collision uh, is formed by quarks and gluons. And uh, it's in a very high temperature 
state. Okay, so people call this uh, the quark-gluon plasma. So very soon after the collision, I guess of, of the order of Fermi over C. Uh, a quark gluon plasma is formed. Okay, so this has uh, high temperature. T larger of or the order of lambda QCD, and then it's formed and then it's uh, an almost perfect fluid. Formed by quarks and glues. No? Okay, so when we have a, something which is weakly coupled, then what happens is uh, the viscosity is large. This happens because particles can travel a long distance before interacting. So this means they can transfer momentum a long distance. And the viscosity is measuring this transfer of momentum. And then when the viscosity is small, uh, this means that uh, these particles have to interact uh, very quickly, so then that corresponds to a strongly coupled fluid. Okay. Yes. It, because it's uh, a time. Ah, Fermi, Fermi, Fermi over C. Are we just estimating this by like, have we have two nuclei and that's characteristic length and characteristic velocity or like? Uh, well, so there is a complicated uh, modeling of this, uh, of this plasma ball, you know? And then uh, what you use is uh, use hydrodynamics to describe the evolution of the quark gluon plasma. And then you have to impose some initial, con just at the moment of the collision, there is no plasma. So you have, there has to be a time where uh, the system thermalizes and form the fluid, okay? And then that's where you impose the initial conditions for the hydrodynamic evolution. And then what is observed is that it seems that this uh, thermalization time is very short, okay? So it's of this order. It could have happened that uh, the thermalization time is much longer and then you don't observe a fluid, right? Just uh, some kind of... Uh, different uh, evolution of the collision. How, how, how do the, the, the heavy ions look exactly originally? What do you see? And, and the fluid that is formed, you see like a, 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 a literal fluid? Well, so I'm not an experimentalist, but uh, First, they strip the nuclei from uh, the atoms from the electrons, right? So they have nuclei, and then they put them in some accelerator, and they make them, it's like a circular accelerator, so they accelerate them over there, and then they make them collide. Okay? And then, uh, so I guess that was the first part of your question. Uh, and then the second part is uh, how do they observe there is a fluid? Yes, so they don't observe it directly because this is a very short uh, time evolution. And what you observe is the final result, which are hadrons distributed in some way. Okay. So they infer there is a fluid because um, when the collision is like this, like not uh, the two nuclei are not completely aligned, this is an isotropic. Okay? So here. So what, sorry? 
anisotropic. Ah, anisotropic. Okay. So here, along this uh, direction, the pressure is larger than in the vertical direction. So this means that here, the fluid is pushed with more force. And then what you will observe is that if you look at the momentum of the particles that come out, they have higher momentum in this direction and lower momentum in this one. So there is like a, a quadruple distribution of the momentum. So they measure this and they can, they see that, that in order to explain this, uh, this is called the elliptic flow. In order to observe this elliptic flow to be as large as they observe, the system uh, should behave like a fluid. Yes. The thermalization time is supposed to be the time from which you can use hydrodynamics. Like before, there are other, um, so people use other uh, kind of modeling of the initial state. There is something called the, the plasma and things like this in order to try to explain the thermalization. People also have tried to use holography to describe thermalization. Okay. But uh, let's say that's uh, uh, a part of the uh, collision evolution, which happens before you can use hydrodynamics. Right. OK. So in this, uh, I shouldn't have, okay, <laughs> sorry. I shouldn't have, uh, it is this, too late. Um, yeah. You said when you have a large viscosity, then we expect the particles or the heavy ions to um, um, uh, to interact weakly, and I one would mm -hmm. expect the other way around, um, so I didn't get that. No, I think the point is that you have a, particles moving with some momentum in this direction. And the viscosity is measuring how much of this momentum is transferred to another layer. Okay, and how far away, let's say. So if you don't have interactions, this momentum can be transferred far away. No? But if you have an interaction very quickly, then the momentum stays in this layer. Okay, so that's, that's how it works. Okay, uh, so just to mention some experiments. We have uh, Rick uh, in Brookhaven, the relativistic heavy ion collider, then LHC. Yeah. Alice, yes, at LHC. And then uh, in these experiments, uh, what happens is what I described here. They are exploring the high temperature regime of QCD. Now there are planned other kind of experiments, okay, where the energy of these uh, nuclei will be smaller. If the energy is smaller, they have lower speeds, and this means that uh, this part, the variance, they will stay around the region of the collision instead of flying away. Okay, so that means that in these experiments, the baryon density will be larger when you decrease the energy. So, lower energy experiments. They can explore a higher baryon density. So we can explore high T and chemical potential. And they are not running yet, but there are a couple of them in planning at least. One is called FAIR, which will be in Germany. 
and the other one is called Nika, which should be in Russia. So, and well, nowadays in RIG, for instance, they are trying to explore lower energies, but not to see exactly the high density regime, but moderate densities to find uh, something that is called the critical point of QCB. I will say a few words more about that later. Now, so these are one kind of experiments that uh, explore this uh, finite temperature and finite chemical potential regime of QCD. Now we have uh, other kind of experiments, or rather observations, which come from astrophysics. So we also have astrophysical observations. Okay, uh, so this, I will explain more how this tells us anything about QCD, but the observations are essentially about the mass of the stars, of neutron stars. and uh, the radius of neutron stars. And there is another quantity which is called tidal deformability. Okay, so this mass can be measured from uh, the period of pulsars in binary systems. And the radius from X-ray emission from the surface of the star. So here there is a observatory in the International Space Station called NICER that is uh, doing these kind of uh, observations. And then the tidal deformabilities can be obtained from uh, the signal from gravitational waves. Emitted in binary measures. Okay, so I will explain all this later. Okay, but here the point is that there are all these kind of astrophysical observations and they tell us something about uh, the finite density uh, regime of uh, QCD. Okay, these are neutron stars, so you can imagine their properties are related to the properties of QCD. Okay, so. So we want to uh, explain the observations in these uh, experiments or in these astrophysical measurements. Then we need to know the phase diagram of QCD and how QCD behaves in its, in its part of the phase diagram. Okay, so I'm going to do a cartoon of the QCD phase diagram. The vertical axis is the temperature and the horizontal is the baryonic chemical potential. We know there is some kind of uh, crossover temperature here, which it's around 155 MeV. So this is a crossover uh, from hadrons to 
to quarks and gluons. Okay, so this is the confinement. We call this the confinement. And uh, there is a line of first order phase transitions here. So this corresponds to the formation of nuclear matter, which is around 940 MeV. Uh, so here you will, you will just have a gas of hadrons and so on. And after you cross this line, you have like the interior of the nuclei. Okay, so nuclear matter. Okay, so this is what we know for sure about the phase diagram. Now, from phenomenological models and from this. Why is it that transition point different from the QCD scale, which is 200 mega electron volts? Well, it's around the same order, but you can have factors of pi or things like that. But this is a, as we'll, this is coming from some number. It's a crossover, so there's not a well-defined point also. So. No, this uh, is like uh, about three times or four times the lambda QCD scale, and that's because variants are made of three quarks, more or less. Okay. So. Now, yes, from phenomenological models and uh, calculations in perturbative QCD and uh, Carrel perturbation theory and other things, we can guess what is the rest of the phase diagram. Okay, so the most common proposal is that uh, there is some line of uh, first order phase transitions that end at some critical point. Okay, so this is the critical point that the new experiments of the uh, RIC uh, laboratory is trying to find. Okay. And so this will be a, some kind of confinement, the confinement transition happening here. No? Here is a crossover, but here it will be a first order transition. But it doesn't reach the zero chemical potential uh, value, but it ends before at this critical point. Yes. Yeah. At this point, yeah. And then, uh, from perturbative calculations, we know that at very large chemical potential and low temperatures, the theory is, uh, should be in a QCD should be in a phase called color superconducting phase. Okay, so there is this means there is some kind of quark condensate. So maybe somewhere here there is some other line of phase transitions. And here we have a color superconductor. Okay. And then, well, this could be a more complicated phase diagram because there could be several different kinds of color superconducting phases. There could be phases that uh, break translational invariance or isotropy. So the phase diagram could be more complicated than this, but uh, this is like a simple guess for what it should be. This? This is where you go from a hadron gas to nuclear matter. Like uh, you start having nuclei here. Now, uh, well, maybe I can use a different color. So, from first principles, what we know is that uh, we can use, uh, as I said, very large temperature or chemical potential. That's large energy scales. So, we can use here perturbative QCD. Q 
Can you see the green? Oh. No? OK. Is there another color? Or? White, yellow, and green. OK. So maybe. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to explain this in a moment. Okay, let me then just do it uh, here in a separate uh, diagram. So roughly speaking, we know we can apply lattice QCD in this region. So we can do uh, calculations using lattice QCD at low densities and high temperature. Okay. Yeah. It's outside. Uh, So we haven't observed the critical point in, well, okay, to be more precise, it's not really known, but to observe a critical point in the lattice is difficult because uh, at the critical point, uh, the correlation length goes to infinity, but you are doing a calculation in finite volume no? because you have to do a finite uh, calculation in numerics. So you have to be able to observe that the correlation length is going to infinity, but as you increase the volume to see this, the calculation becomes more and more costly. So, but in principle, it has not been observed in the lattice calculations. Now you have also a very large chemical potential and temperature. You have perturbative QCD. Okay. So here is where you can see this color superconductor. And then uh, you can use something like uh, effective theories to be close to the saturation, well, close to this nuclear matter density. So this will be effective theories. OK, so now, yeah. What's the abstraction? Yes, so, OK. The way the lattice calculation works is that um, you're doing, uh, what's the right word? Ah, I can do it. So the lattice is computing a partition function, doing a path integral over, these are essentially like the gauge fields that you describe as uh, elements of the group between two lattice sites. And then you have uh, something which will be the jam mills action that depends on these uh, link variables. And uh, you have the quarks, right? So because the action for the quarks is quadratic, you can just integrate them out. And you have something like a determinant of the uh, Dirac operator for the quarks. OK? So at zero chemical potential, you can uh, show that uh, this is a real quantity and positive, in fact. So then uh, what people do is a Monte Carlo kind of calculation where you just throw random numbers, and if they fall below some value, you keep them. No? Uh, so this is easy to do because this is uh, positive. 
when you have the variant in chemical potential, this becomes complex. And then what happens is if you want to sum over different uh, configurations of these uh, gauge fields, then there are cancellations because, uh, well, each configuration contributes with a different phase. Okay, so then these cancellations numerically become exponentially harder to compute. Okay, so it's not uh, that you could not compute them in principle, but uh, in practice, in practice, it's exponentially hard to do this calculation numerically. Okay, so that's called the sign problem of the lattice QCD. This determinant. is complex. So people is trying to go around this, but so far it's not uh, advanced enough to do a calculation for QCD. Okay. Yes? Why did you think that it was complex? Yes, so what people usually mean is that uh, you have a non-zero expectation value of uh, a bilinear operator of quark quark. Okay, so this object, so this is a weakly coupled uh, statement. So this means that this uh, object has a color charts, non-zero color charts. Okay, so it's breaking spontaneously the color symmetry. Okay, so that's what people mean by the color superconductor. Okay. More questions? Okay, so, so these are the first principle tools that, that I mentioned before, and these are the regions of the phase diagram they cover. Uh, from experiments of heavy ion collisions, we are exploring this region of the phase diagram. So this will be like RIC and LHC. Then one can extract information from the cosmological evolution of the early universe that is something like this. So this here will be like early universe. And these other experiments I mentioned before of heavy ions uh, explore some region like this. This will be like Fer and Nika. Okay, so neutron stars, to answer some question, lay somewhere around here. Okay, so they explore the region of the phase diagram, which is very low temperature, and densities above the nuclear density. Okay, this is at the core. No? As you go to the uh, exterior, when you reach the surface, then uh, what you have is like, uh, well, just ions and electrons and things like this. Okay, I will say a few more things. But inside the core, you explore this region. And this region inside the core of the neutron stars is outside all these uh, approaches. No? So it's, it's a strongly coupled region outside the validity of perturbative QCD is at a density which is too large to apply effective field theory or lattice QCD. Okay, so, so we don't have any first principle tool to describe this region at the core of the neutron star. Yes? Uh, in, in this, uh, how can we interpret density in this plot? Well, the larger the chemical potential is, the larger is the density. Larger the oh okay, so it's just um, I see okay, okay. It, it increases with the chemical potential. Thanks. Okay. So here we have this same problem that I mentioned before, and here we have a strong coupling, and here this is uh, valid only at low energies, and then these densities are too large for this low energy expansion to be valid. So what people do to describe this is uh, either use phenomenological models in field theory, just 
take one of these models that you fit to uh, you know, uh, nuclear physics and then extrapolate it to these densities. And what we will do is to use uh, the gauge gravity duality holography to try to describe this region. Okay, so the gauge gravity duality doesn't have a same problem. You can describe finite density states without uh, issues in principle. It's uh, not formulated at a strong coupling, so it's natural to apply it in this regime. And then it doesn't require like some low energy e expansion. In principle, you can use a gauge gravity du dual to describe any energy scale. So holography. does not have uh, the issues of other approaches. So it's natural to apply it there. Uh, however, no, we should also like remark the caveats that enter in using gauge gravity duality. No, when we know how to use it, typically we have a gauge group which could be like an SUNC, but with the number of colors and C is going to infinity, it's very large, no? because otherwise we will have to use quantum gravity, which we don't understand very well. And then uh, we have uh, also some very large coupling. So the tough coupling which is defined as g squared jam mills times nc, must be much larger than one, because otherwise we will have to consider <laughs> string geek corrections, alpha prime corrections. So, in the regime where we understand better the dualities, that means classical gravity, then we have to do this additional, uh, uh, take these limits, large n, and a strong coupling, very strong coupling. Okay? I say the neutron stars at a strong coupling, but not asymptotically strong. Maybe the coupling is around 10 or something like this, to say a number. Okay, so. When we use the gauge gravity duality, it's uh, in some sense similar to these phenomenological models. Okay, so we are going to have some theory that uh, resembles QCD, has some properties like QCD, we can put it at finite density. But then if we want to compare to observations or experiments, we need to extrapolate from these limits. Okay, and in that case, it's an extrapolation. We don't really know if it's uh, working completely or not. But nevertheless, we might be able to extract uh, some lessons. Okay, so typically, when people is doing uh, these gauge gravity models, there are two approaches people use. So one approach is uh, to look uh, for universality. Okay, so find quantities that are not uh, model dependent or they don't depend much on the model you are looking at. And in this case, people use stringy constructions, typically. And this is called the top down approach. 
or you can try to be more phenomenological, try to fit as much as of QCD as you can. And extrapolate, as I was saying. And then this is typically uh, bottom-up constructions. So maybe there is no string theory realization of these phenomenological models that we know. Okay. So, so I'm going to try to give an overview of uh, this kind of uh, approach of using holography to describe uh, dense matter and apply it to these neutron stars. Uh, questions up to here? Yes? Say it again. Uh, crossover temperature is... Crossover right. temperature is same as deconfinement temperature? Deconfinement temperature? Yeah. Uh, in this uh, zero chemical potential, roughly, because there is no a sharp transition. Okay. But uh, in the holographic models, because of this larger limit, the transition is going to be first order, so that will be the same. Yeah. Okay, so, so let me start by saying a few things about how the stars are modeled in the astrophysical uh, setup. So how to extract information about QCD from neutron stars. Okay, so in order to understand this, we need to know how we model the star. Okay, so we start with the Einstein equations. No? This will be the Einstein equations in our universe, let's say. Okay, and then uh, the star is uh, introducing some non-zero energy momentum tensor. No? The matter that is forming the star is sourcing the metric through the Einstein equations. And then what people usually assume is that uh, we can use an ideal fluid form for the energy momentum tensor and assume isotropy. And this means that the energy momentum tensor can be written in this way. So this uh, energy, this is the energy density. And this P is the pressure. Okay, so the matter has some energy density and produces some pressure and this gives us this energy momentum tensor. Now, because the system is isotropic, uh, we can assume spherical symmetry if the star is not rotating. Okay, so we are going to do that for simplicity. And then the metric uh, will have uh, this form. So there is the time component with some factor that depends on 
the radial coordinate. Then there is some factor of times the radial coordinate. And then there is the this part where this is the metric of a two sphere. Okay, so this uh, this has a spherical symmetry. So in the usual spherical coordinates, this is just. Uh, This thing here. Okay, so given this uh, set of equations, uh, we also have another equation for the energy momentum tensor, which uh, is the conservation equation. So that equation will be. Uh, the, the divergence of the energy momentum tensor is zero. Okay, so you can massage these equations and first one writes some this in a slightly different form, this uh, factor that appears in the radial coordinate as one minus two G Newton M of R over R. And this M of R is given by so an equation like this. Okay, so M of R, if you integrate this equation, will be the integral between zero and R, dr prime for pi r prime square. So this is the mass up to radius r. Okay. This is just the mass up to radius r. And this looks similar to what you have in the Schwarzschild metric. No? Is that in the Schwarzschild metric, this m will be a constant. Uh, this other word factor has an equation like this. d nu of dr equals minus 2 over E plus P DP over DR. And finally, the radial derivative of the pressure has an equation like this. Okay, so in all these expressions, even if I don't write it explicitly, the energy, the pressure, and the mass are functions of the radial coordinate. Okay. Okay, so this set of equations have a name. They're called the Tolman Oppenheimer Volkov equations. T O V equations. Okay, and they they describe the interior of the neutron star. Okay. These equations. So what you do is uh, to have the complete uh, form of the metric and the distribution of matter of the star is you need to impose some condition at the surface. So if you have a star 
of radius r. Okay, these stars will be in equilibrium, so that means that uh, since there is no matter outside, there is no pressure. Yes. So uh, this is the simplest case we are studying here, right? Well, that was in the heavy ion collision. Oh, okay. But here, here I'm not even saying this is quark gluon matter. Uh, okay. This could be just any kind of matter. Uh, and uh, this is a bottom-up approach, right? Bottom-up approach. Is what? This is bottom-up. Uh, ah. So this is just, uh, here I'm not using holography or anything. Uh, this is just purely astrophysics, if uh, you want. Okay. So you can have any kind of matter. Just you assume that these two properties for this matter. Uh, okay. And then this is uh, the general equations that will describe the metric and the distribution of matter for the star. Uh, okay. 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 So here there is no holography. Okay, thank you. Okay. So here, if we have a star of radius r, uh, since there is nothing outside, for this to be in equilibrium, the pressure at the surface has to be zero, no? because otherwise the star will start expanding. So we need to impose that at the surface. P at the radius r is zero. Okay, that's the boundary condition. Then the total mass is just uh, little m at r equals r. So the integral of the energy density with the a volume factor, volume measure. And then, uh, well, one imposes these boundary conditions and solves that equation, and that gives the metric and the distribution of matter inside the star. Outside the star, then one just has uh, the vacuum, no matter, but there is a mass inside a, a sphere that is around the star. So that means the metric outside should be the Schwarzschild metric. Okay. So outside the star, we just use the Schwarzschild. with the total mass of the star. Okay, and then, well, we just have to fix the integration constants for the uh, factors in the metric in such a way that the metric is continuous uh, at the surface of the star. Okay? That will fix some integration constants of these uh, factors. Yeah. Outside the star, the energy density and the pressure are zero, right? Outside the star, the energy density and the pressure are zero. Yes. Okay. So how one can get Schwarzschild metric from the second equation because p is zero and then we obtain nu equal constant? So these are the equations, these are these equations after you have done some manipulations. Uh -huh. yeah. Okay. But if you start with the vacuum equations, uh, uh, yeah. the Schwarzschild okay. metric is a solution. Ah, okay, okay. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is yeah. In order to derive that, you need uh, yeah. to do some manipulations. Not that. Yes. This kind of equations, uh, what is the input? Or like, uh, so is epsilon, so can we pick a, a certain epsilon and solve the equations, or are all of the quantities determined by the equations? Yes, I'm going to discuss this uh, ah, okay. now. Right. It's a good question. Yeah. Okay. 
Yes. Uh, in the short geometric, yeah. yes, we have a singularity. Uh, and what does it mean in terms of the star? Well, the singularity in the Schwarzschild metric is at r equal to zero, mm -hmm. but that's in the interior. <laughs> so okay. before you reach that part, you have to change the metric to the metric of the interior, which is not singular. Okay. The metric of the interior will be given by this after you solve the equations. Yes? Combining the Einstein's equation and putting in the energy momentum conservation, we get just two equations, dynamical equations, like means. Well, we get uh, these three equations, right? So this is the equation that defines the mass, if you want. And then you have the, the tenders in lambda. I see. Okay. Then you have this equation that corresponds to the other factor, and this is the equation okay. that determines okay. the okay. pressure. Okay, yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so before I go to this question of, uh, like, what do we need to solve these equations, let me just uh, do some estimate of the uh, scales of of the neutron star. This, for this, we don't need to know the energy density or the pressure. OK, so. Okay, so first of all, um, from here we can get the Schwarzschild radius, right? And uh, if we have a star, it should be such that the uh, radius is larger than the ra Schwarzschild radius, no? Because otherwise there will be an event horizon and we will not be able to observe any star. Okay, so that means that this quantity has some um, upper bound, okay, which is given by the uh, value for a black hole. No? So for a black hole, this quantity is called the compactness, which is g n m over r, is one half. And then for any star, the compactness has to be smaller than one half. Otherwise, otherwise there is no star, just a black hole. Now, we can, let's assume that there is just one single relevant scale, which is lambda QCD. So let's assume that uh, the energy density and the pressure are determined by the QCD scale. They have units of energy of over volume, so that means they have, in natural units, energy to the four. So this is, they go like lambda QCD to the four. No? Then the mass is going to go like the radius cube of the star times lambda QCD to the four. And then the compactness is like G Newton 
the radius cube lambda q is equal to the four divided by the radius. So this is like the radius square. And in natural units, this is one over the Planck mass square. In Planck. Okay, so this is like 200 MeV square over 10 to the 19, sorry, to the 4, GV square. So from here I can solve for the radius in terms, in terms of the compactness. So if you plug numbers there, this is like the radius square is like 625 times 10 to the 40, the compactness in units of GV to the minus 2. And then we can use that 1 GV is roughly speaking 5 times 10 to the 13 inverse centimeters, 1 GV is 1 over 78 times 10 to the minus 24 grams, and the solar mass is 2 times 10 to the 30 kilograms. Okay, so if you plug, uh, use these conversions for this quantity, then you find that the radius is smaller than 35, well, from the condition that C is smaller than one half, but the compactness is smaller than one half. The radius will be smaller than 35 kilometers, and the mass will be smaller than eight times a solar mass, roughly speaking. Okay, so this gives us more or less the order of magnitude, like uh, tens of kilometers for the star, and something a few times a solar mass. We can be more precise if we use the typical compactness of a neutron star. Okay, so the typical compactness is as much smaller than one half. It's like 0.16. And that gives a radius of around 20 kilometers and a mass of around 1.4 solar masses. So this is much closer to the actual values of astrophysical objects, okay, of real neutron stars. Okay, so it's, uh, as you see, in some sense, the radius and the mass of the star are given by the ratio between the QCD scale and the Planck scale. Yeah. Hmm. So the C uh, smaller than one, uh, one half is a restriction for the star not to be a black hole, correct? Yeah. So shouldn't that imply a lower bound on the radius instead of an upper bound? I put, no, C is smaller than one half, so the radius is smaller than one half times this. R squared is proportional to this C. So if C is smaller than this, the radius is smaller also. No? no? Uh, no, it's, uh, it's smaller, but has less mass than a black hole. So it's not... If it had the same mass as a black hole, then it should be larger. But what happens is that it's both smaller and has a lower mass. Mm. So, yeah, that's the way it works. Thank you. So black holes 
more massive black holes have larger radius actually than the neutron stars. Okay, so this, uh, well, this already gives you more or less how the star is going to look at. No? Now, if you want to be precise, you have to solve these equations, no? So, as you ask, uh, how do I solve this equation? Then I can solve for the mass by using this, if I know the energy density. I can solve for this uh, work factor, if I know both the energy density and the pressure. And I could solve from the pressure from here. But I'm missing something because I have both energy density and pressure as variables in principle. So I need an extra equation that gives me a relation between the pressure and the energy density to solve the equations. Okay? And that's the equation of a state. So, okay, I guess we can state this here. Yes. To solve the T of E equations. We need additional input. And that will be the equation of a state. Which is just uh, how the pressure depends on the energy density or vice versa. Okay, so then once the OS is known, we can find the star profile. specifying, for instance, the pressure at the origin. Okay. So if we know the equation of a state and we specify the central pressure, then the TV equations give us a solution for the star. Yes. This P of zero is also some input we need? Or, or well, it is determined by the equations? We have a set of solutions that correspond to different stars. So in order to, a way to parameterize this set of solutions is by the central pressure. Okay, another way will be specifying the mass and radius, for instance. I see, I see. Right? So we can trade one of mass of mass or radius by the central pressure in parameterizing. The mass and radius don't fully fix the... They do, yeah. Yeah, but yeah. then you means you can't use both mass, radius, and central pressure. That is overdetermined, right? So if one of them have to. Go yeah, okay, yeah. Okay, okay. Let's say for this set of equations, the natural thing is to give uh, an initial value for the pressure to solve this equation. Mm -hmm. So you I give see, the I central see. pressure as the initial value, okay. and then that gives you the fully the solution. Okay. So I guess it's time. Uh, yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Questions? Okay. Um, 
Very dumb question. Uh, from my past recollection, when someone uses uh, T O V equations, mm. uh, there is an upper bound on the pressure that can, th th they kind of have some upper bound on the pressure that cannot be exceeded. Otherwise, you know, there is some sort some some instability with that. Uh, can you comment on this if you do recollect that as well? You will comment more about this kind of stability, but from the point of view of the mass and radius, but uh, it's related. Uh, okay. And yeah. second thing, uh, I was just asking myself, uh, uh, since T of E equations are kind of a mess to work with, uh, can someone work in a some sort of post-Newtonian approximation as well, or is it not good enough an approximation for a neutron star? Uh, you can do a Newtonian approximation, yeah, like, uh, but, for the I mean, like uh, keeping uh, corrections of one over c squared, for instance, because you know, those equations, if someone takes the limit of c going to infinity, are just is just Newtonian hydrostatics. But technically, one could keep finite corrections of order one over c squared. I was just asking myself whether that would be good enough. Yeah, you can do uh, an approximation where the mass is small, right, and then. If the mass is small, this will look kind of a Newtonian equation. But uh, I think you can do this approximation for maybe a small neutron stars, but not for the heavier ones. It's not such a good approximation. Thank you. Not, uh, eventually, you'll get into a black hole, right? I mean, the neutron stars, the limit of neutron stars is for them to go into, I mean, the T of V limit or, no, yeah, T of V limit is for them to go to, into black hole. So. The point is either the radius, the outside radius, or the pressure in the middle, they have a maximum that corresponds to going to black hole. So. Uh, when you computed the compactness or estimated it, there is like 0 0.2 giga electron volts to the power of fourth over 10 to the 19th to the power of two. And then like in the next equation, the R squared is uh, uh, approximately equal to 10 to the power of four. Of uh, this is like, uh, can you please explain it again? <laughs> I can't really see that. Let me see. Uh, just in case I didn't copy it correctly. Uh, uh, where is this? Okay. Ah, yes, there is a typo, I think. So it should be 40 here. Yeah. <laughs> With cuts. <laughs> In QCD, pressure, P, and energy density, E are functions of mu and T. So how can we write P is P of E? Yes, so typically you assume that the temperature is zero. And in most cases, the star is isothermal. It's a good approximation for if it's long lived enough. So there is just one variable, which would be the chemical potential in that case. No more questions? All right, let's uh, thank Carlos and go to <laughs> talk to the record. Okay.